Good afternoon, and welcome to the Adith Israel Congregation Adult Lecture Series. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us Daniel Pomerantz, the CEO of Honest Reporting, who will be speaking to us on defending Israel from media bias, holding the world press accountable. My name is Ira Smith. I have been an Adith Israel member for a very long time, and I also serve on several committees. We recognize that these are difficult times that our community is experiencing, and we hope that you and your family are safe, healthy, well, and secure. I would like to thank the Adult Education Committee under the leadership of Joe Traeger and our Executive Director, Phil David and his entire staff for putting on this afternoon's program. We are very pleased to have, acting as our moderator, Barbara Banks. Barbara's involvement in the Jewish community dates back several decades and demonstrates her strong commitment to a range of areas, especially those having to do with the United Jewish Appeal Campaign, Holocaust education, and Israel advocacy on university campuses. Barbara is currently the chair of the Greater Toronto Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, which is the advocacy agent of the Jewish Federations of Canada at the federal, provincial, and municipal levels of government. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our moderator for this afternoon's lecture, Barbara Banks. Thank you, Ira. I'm very happy to be here today. As the advocacy agent of UJA and Jewish federations across Canada, CJA is the most quoted Jewish organization in Canadian media, and we take great pride in ensuring that our community's voice is heard. CJA frequently meets with journalists and the editorial boards of Canadian media outlets to share our community's perspectives on the most important issues of the day. Canadian journalists often talk to us about the important work being done by Honest Reporting Canada. When covering Israel and the Middle East, Canadian journalists know that if they get something wrong, Honest Reporting Canada will hold them to account. Together, CJA and Honest Reporting Canada are at the forefront of addressing media bias and ensuring that coverage of Israel and Canada's Jewish community is carried out accurately, objectively, and in good faith. Our guest today, Daniel Pomerantz, is a news and political analyst, lawyer, and CEO of Honest Reporting. Daniel began his career as an attorney where he worked for high-profile law firms in New York. As CEO of Honest Reporting, Daniel manages the entire organization, conducting professional news and political analysis through constant research, as well as proactive communication on social and conventional media. Honest Reporting combats the false depiction of Israel in the media by challenging biased coverage and demanding accountability. Its mission is to educate the public and to empower the grassroots to respond in an effective manner. Daniel serves on the faculty at the Interdisciplinary Center University in Herzliya and Bar Ilan University. He is also a contributor to many news outlets and is a frequent on-air panelist for I-24 News and ILTV News. Due to his expertise in business as well as US and international law, Daniel brings a unique perspective to legal and political discussion and analysis. Throughout his talk today, you will have an opportunity to post your questions to Daniel, and I'll do my best to cover as many of them as possible. Daniel, we are honored to have you here today with us at Adath Israel, and look forward to hearing about your experiences defending Israel against media bias, and how it may be similar or dissimilar to our experience here in Canada. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Barbara, and thank you to the whole congregation. It's really wonderful to be here. This has been a long time coming, and there's so many of you watching. And uh, I really hope that uh, someday soon, uh, conditions will permit me to actually speak to you in person. So hopefully that day will come. 
Uh, I'm Daniel Pomerantz. I'm the CEO of Honest Reporting, which interestingly is actually a different organization from Honest Reporting Canada. We know them, we like them, uh, but we are two different organizations. Uh, both of us are nonprofits and we are a, a, a tax exempt nonprofit and everything that we do is, is, is uh, funded uh, by private donations. And I wanna tell you a little bit about how we got started because it's really a, an incredible story. And it happened just 20 years ago uh, this year, uh, 20 years ago, just uh, several months ago. Uh, I'm gonna try a screen share and let's see if I get this right. Um, I'm going to uh, share this screen and here we go. Looks like I got it right. All right, now if you can, <clears throat> you should be able to see a news article posted up here on the screen. And this news article came out uh, 20 years ago this year. And it says at the bottom, an Israeli policeman and a Palestinian on the Temple Mount. And this was put out by the Associated Press and it appeared in news outlets all over the world, including in the New York Times. Now, if you uh, if we have any <clears throat> Hebrew speakers here, if you take a look uh, just over um, just over the, the top right shoulder of the policeman, uh, you can see in tiny uh, little letters. If you read Hebrew, you can you can give it a shot and exercise it. It says um, uh, "le liter soler," which means um, the price uh, per liter of diesel fuel. So, if you've ever been to Israel and been up to the Temple Mount, you know there is not a gas station on the Temple Mount. So, right off the bat, you know that the caption editor was not doing uh, their job properly. Uh, but it's worse than that. This uh, young man you see in front of you with blood on his face, who they're calling a Palestinian, was actually a a Jewish kid named Tuvia Grossman from Chicago who came to study in yeshiva and he was attacked by a Palestinian mob. And the policeman is not beating anyone. He's holding up his stick to ward off the mob and uh, and save this this young young man, pro probably saved his life. Uh, and and this police officer is actually Druze, which is, um, is it's its own ethnic identity, but their, their main language is Arab. And sometimes they, they uh, self-identify as Arab, sometimes not. But it's so backwards from what the caption said. This isn't Jews versus Palestinians. This isn't Israelis versus Arabs. Here is uh, a Druze Arab speaking man protecting an American Jewish boy from a Palestinian hate mob. And this is the message I always like to say to people that the, the story here is really about people who care about peace and coexistence versus people who are trying to harm peace and coexistence and, and, and prevent it. And, and that's really what the story of the Middle East is about. But this narrative, this story that the New York Times wanted to tell is, you know, they're not going to let the truth get in the way of a good story. Uh, so at the time, 20 years ago, it was before social media, but uh, the, um, the, the folks, uh, some folks put together a, a, an email campaign and uh, put some pressure on the New York Times to change the caption, and they did. And that email list became the genesis of Honest Reporting. And 20 years later, we're doing all sorts of work in, in lots of uh, different areas. So I'm going to uh, stop the uh, screen share now, um, or I, I guess so we can we can just move away from the screen. There we go. It's so great to have producers making it everything easy for me. Uh, so I, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we're uh, what we're dealing with uh, just this week, and then uh, also I'll go on to show you a debate that I had on television. We can go through some of the fine points about how to communicate on these difficult issues, even in a, a polarized time when when people find it hard to talk. There are ways to do it. It doesn't work always. Some people are, are, are very easily offended and there's no getting past that, but there are ways to speak about the things that are passionate to you uh, in a way that's more engaging uh, and less um, likely to turn people off. Uh, but, but first, I'd like to talk to you about what we're doing this week. And what we're doing this week is dealing with, um, uh, you know, there's this Iranian nuclear scientist named uh, Fakhrizadeh, um, it's a hard name to pronounce, uh, and he was killed presumably by Israel. And uh, the uh, European Union and uh, and also some other uh, talking heads and various people, former uh, CIA chief uh, named Brennan, was uh, they um, they made the the claim that this is a war crime and that it violates international law. But they never said how or why. And I have a problem with that. You know, I'm I'm uh, as you know from my introduction, I'm a recovering lawyer. The first step is admitting that you are a lawyer. And, uh, and since then, you know, I've gone on to do some other things, but my law background has always stayed with me and helped me to analyze what I see in a way that's very, very helpful. And so when a legal issue like this comes up, I wrote an article and I also appeared in a press conference with our Media Central Division. Now, Honest Reporting 
criticizes journalists when they get things wrong. But another thing is we also have a separate division called Media Central, and we help journalists to find the story. We put on press conferences, we have field tours. For example, when rockets are falling on the communities near Gaza, we will take journalists, put them on a bus, and take them right down to, uh, to the Gaza border to see for themselves. And it really impacts the way they report the story because they end up seeing things that they never, that they never experienced firsthand. Uh, so uh, I appeared in a Media Central press conference talking about the content of this paper that I wrote as a legal expert. And uh, here's what I talked about. Does this violate international law or not? Now, if we had a smaller number of people and we had the ability to talk to each other, I might open it up to, uh, to people to, to share their thoughts and, and say what you think. Uh, of course, there's, um, uh, that's a little bit difficult to do uh, in this form because there's so many of you, which is a blessing. Uh, so instead, I'll just give you the answer that the law is not just a matter of opinion. The way the law works is uh, in this particular area, you first have to ask yourself, what area of law am I dealing with? Well, this is the law of war. And specifically, it's governed by the Fourth Geneva Convention. And specifically, what happened here is governed by what's called the First Additional Protocol to the Fourth Geneva Convention. It sounds like a lot of jargon, but the point is you have to know where to look. And there are three questions that you're going to see. And this is what I said to the journalist. I said, look, I'm going to give you the three questions. Anybody analyzing this issue has to analyze these three questions and give you the three answers. Now, lawyers could disagree on the conclusion, but lawyers cannot disagree on how to do the analysis. You have to raise these questions and you have to answer them. The first question is, are there hostilities? And, uh, and my conclusion, I suppose someone could argue, but my conclusion is there are. Iran frequently says that their goal is to wipe Israel off the map and they're fighting proxy wars through Hezbollah and Hamas and others to try and do that. And they have forces in Syria, including actual Iranian generals in Syria. They are clearly fighting hostilities against Israel. The Geneva Conventions intentionally doesn't use the word war. It uses the word uh, hostilities because they don't want a situation where someone could just not declare war and suddenly they don't have to follow the Geneva Convention. So whether you call it a war or whether you call it something else, if it's hostilities, this applies. Uh, the second question is, was the person who, uh, who was, was uh, targeted a civilian? You're not allowed to target civilians. Uh, now, the, the question here is, you know, whether uh, Fakhrizadeh was a civilian. I actually saw a profile of Fakhrizadeh in the Washington Post. And in that uh, profile, there were 1,055 words. Eight of those words were the word scientist. Two of the words were the words professor. At no point in the article, zero of the words were the guy's actual title, which was brigadier general in the Iran's elite IRGC military force. This guy is a brigadier general, and the Washington Post couldn't even bring themselves to say it. And by the way, this is specifically what honest reporting is about. We're not about defending Israel at any cost. Israel gets things wrong just like any other modern Western liberal democracy, and we don't try to defend Israel when they do something wrong. We just believe that Israel ought to be represented fairly. So, for example, you know, sometimes there will be a stabbing attack and, and uh, an Israeli police officer, this is the classic example, an Israeli police officer uh, shoots the, the terrorist while they're in the act of stabbing and in doing so saves the life of an innocent victim. And then you'll see a headline that says, Israeli police shoot Palestinian man to death. Well, technically, that's not incorrect. The Israeli police did shoot, and, and the, the attacker was killed, and the attacker was Palestinian. But they left out the whole part about the terrorist attack, which was really the, the core of what was happening in that situation. Uh, and then this is similar. This uh, Somebody, presumably Israel, killed uh, an Iranian nuclear scientist professor, but also brigadier general in the Iran's elite fighting force who was working on a military uh, weapons project on military bases. And we just believe that you can you can say it was wrong to kill him, but you cannot hide the fact that he was a military general. That is not uh, ethical journalism. And that's the standards by which honest reporting functions. So uh, he, he was um, not a civilian. He was uh, both he had a rank in the military and he was working on a military weapons project. He was clearly a soldier in the act of performing his, his duties as a soldier, which was to, to work on a weapons project. And so the third question is, did the attacking uh, force or attacking power uh, behave in a way designed to minimize civilian casualties? So like I said, you can never target civilians under international law. You can never, ever, ever target civilians. But sometimes a civilian might get killed, not because you targeted them, 
but be by accident. And uh, this happens frequently, especially when you're dealing with terror groups who use civilians as human shields. If a rocket is firing out of Gaza and those rockets are heading toward Tel Aviv, well, I'm in Tel Aviv, I'm a civilian, and I want the IDF to destroy those rocket launchers. Now, I don't want the IDF to hurt civilians, but if Hamas takes a bunch of civilians and puts them in front of this rocket launcher, well, if the IDF doesn't destroy the rocket launcher, then I'm going to be in danger, and I'm a civilian too. If the IDF does destroy the rocket launcher, the civilians near it will be in danger. So there's no easy answer. But what international law says is that you cannot target civilians, but as long as you've made an effort to avoid harm to civilian people and also civilian infrastructure, then uh, that meets the standards of international law. And uh, in this case, the strike was highly targeted. It targeted just one person. And this is sometimes intuitively troubling to us. We say, well, it's wrong to go out and kill a person. It's an assassination. It's, it's almost like street crime, a thuggery, right? And, and that's if you compare it to doing nothing at all. If you say, you know what, why attack him when you could just stay home? But of course, staying home means that there's a risk that Iran will build its, its weapons project. And that puts people like me living in Tel Aviv uh, in danger. And so uh, we say you shouldn't be comparing a targeted strike to sitting on your hands and doing nothing. You should compare it to the more likely alternative which was the potential of Israel eventually having to launch a wider uh, military campaign. Uh, there was a great article in the Jerusalem Post by uh, Yonah Jeremy Bob where he analyzed that uh, Israel was probably trying to avoid a larger aerial campaign, which would have caused widespread civilian casualties and may not have even uh, completely worked in destroying the nuclear facilities. And uh, so this was a highly targeted strike. It targeted one person. It caused zero civilian casualties, at least if you uh, uh, accept the analysis that Fakhrizadeh is not a civilian. Uh, and it was definitely in the context of uh, two powers who have uh, hostilities with each other. And so on that basis, my conclusion is that it, it meets the standards of international law. And again, what I said to the journalists is if another lawyer wants to disagree on my conclusions and say, no, there really aren't hostilities, uh, no, he really uh, isn't military, he really is a civilian, or no, the, the attack wasn't highly targeted, you could make an effort to do that. I think it would be a stretch. I don't know how you could do it successfully. Uh, but, uh, but no lawyer uh, can do this analysis without examining those three questions. And so hopefully I, uh, I inspire the journalists to not just blindly repeat what the European Union says, oh, this is a flagrant violation of international law and a war crime. Don't just repeat it. Take the time to push your sources and your interviewees on the analysis and see if they hold up. And that's uh, the level of depth we would like to achieve in news here at Honest Reporting. Uh, so now, uh, with that said, uh, I'd like to um, uh, to do a little bit of um, work with that. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, Barbara, are you are you here with us, Barbara? I, I, yes, I, I am. Uh, great. So, um, you know, given where the time is and the number of questions, we have a choice and we could go one of two different directions. I could show you an interview that I did uh, with uh, Omar Barghouti, who's uh, the founder of the BDS movement, in which I show you how I addressed some of his, he's very effective at reaching young people and, and uh, progressive people. And I show you how I addressed what he was saying in a way that can also reach young and progressive people. Uh, or we can get into some of the questions uh, since I see there are a lot of them uh, accumulating, what do you think would be a, a good thing to do here? I actually think that if you, you continue and mm -hmm. the, the questions for the end, it would probably be more effective and give people time to um, ask their questions. Right now, we do have a number of them, but I think uh, we'll have a lot more. Okay, great. And Barbara, about how long do you think uh, uh, I should take uh, moving forward from here? I would say probably until about 1.40. So here, okay. 20, 20 more minutes. Is that all right? Okay. That's perfect. Okay, all right. So, all right. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so this is so neat. It's like it's almost like really being uh, being on stage at uh, at Eth Israel. Uh, all right. So now I'm going to do a uh, screen share again, and let's see if I uh, get it right. Um, okay. Now I'm going to share a screen, um, and I'm going to also share the audio. And here we go. And if I did this right, there we go. You should see me. There we go. You see my uh, my YouTube uh, screen up there. And let me make this uh, full screen here. There we go. And now I'm going to play for you the beginning of this uh, interview here. This is a highlight reel. This was actually a 20-minute uh, uh, 
uh, debate on, uh, on live international television, but uh, I'm going to show you just a little bit of the higher light reel here. A Palestinian-led campaign against Israel is called Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions, or BDS. Uh, BDS aims to end injustice and inequality and a denial of human rights. What is your response to that? Okay, so here, here he comes out right off the bat. It, it, it aims to end injustice, denial of human rights, inequality. And he says to me, what's your response to that? And, you know, sometimes when you're talking... Uh, it's easy to get defensive about that and say, no, that's not really what it's about. And what about uh, terrorism? And what about this? And what about that? But that's, you know, that's not going to be a way to really engage people. Because if you're talking, remember, when you're in a debate, especially a televised debate, I'm not really talking to Omar Barghouti. I'm talking to all the people who are listening to me. And even if you're speaking in your community, you might be speaking to a person, but there might be other people in the room listening to you, even if it's just among friends or if it's in a public forum on on television or, or uh, on, on a stage in a, in a discussion group, there are always people listening to you. And that's who I'm really communicating to. And I know that I'm speaking to a lot of people uh, here who are progressive, who believe in, in liberal values, who are, um, who are young and uh, idealistic. And the point I want to make is you don't have to uh, abandon liberal values to believe in Israel. Quite the contrary. When it comes to liberal values, Israel is just as good and just as flawed as any other modern Western liberal democracy. So what did I say in response to, uh, to, to um, Barghouti's statement? Well, my response is really not relevant. I think what's important is Mr. Barghouti's response. In 2013, he said in a lecture, and I quote, definitely, most definitely, we oppose a Jewish state in any part of Palestine. The purpose of the BDS movement is to put an end to the Jewish state of Israel in any borders whatsoever. It's a destructive movement. And what's most disturbing is that the movement misleads young people who really do care about social justice. Okay, so you can see what I did there. I mean, first of all, you can't really tell this, but I'm sitting there with an earpiece in my ear. It's not very high quality. I can barely hear the, the questions uh, and the, the discussion. I'm sitting in front of a camera, so I'm not in the room with the people. So I'm trying to to create a feeling like I'm there and engaging while at the same time staring at a camera and having an earpiece in my ear. Uh, so it's very difficult. But uh, but basically what I'm saying is, look, I know that if you believe in progressive values and human rights and liberal values, you don't want anyone to be harmed. You don't want anyone to be unequal. But you also don't want to end the state of Israel, which is what the BDS movement is about. Now, a lot of young people who participate in it don't realize this. They They are idealistic and they may not intend for that, but they don't know they're supporting a movement that does. And the reason I know this is because of reviewed the statements of its founders, including Mr. Barghouti, with whom I'm debating here. So in this case, I did a little bit of my homework. What I'm working on here is a principle of two major, major components that I try to bring to any discussion, whether it's a debate, whether it's a talk or discussion. Number one, try to be smart and likable. Have just enough knowledge and just enough jargon to make it clear that you know what you're talking about, but not so much that you seem out of touch or cold hearted or anything like that. Number two, meet people where they are. Where they are might not be where you are or where you think they ought to be, but you have to meet people where they are in order to engage them. And so that's what I'm uh, working working to do here. The things are living not just under military occupation, not just under a system of colonization, but under a system of apartheid. So BDS aims to end this oppression so that Palestinians can enjoy freedom, justice, and equality. Uh, he's so good. He's, he's using all the right words. Freedom, justice, equality, ending oppression, ending apartheid. It's exactly the right thing to say. And here is where it's really tempting to want to do the, the, the one of the worst things you can do in debating or in marketing, which is to use the word not. You know, you want to jump in and say Israel is not an apartheid state. Israel is not oppressive. Israel is not, not, not. But what have you just done? <laughs> what you've done is you've taken the word Israel and the word apartheid or the word oppression and use them together in the same sentence over and over and over again. It creates what psychologists and marketing professionals call a word association. And that's the last thing you want to do. It also puts you on the defensive. So my challenge, and keep in mind, I get about, you know, 10 seconds to think about how I'm going to do this. 
Although the truth is I know in advance what the issues are, so I've thought about it in advance and I've done research in advance, uh, but I don't know exactly how the host is gonna phrase the questions or how the other person on the show is gonna phrase the answers. So I have to adapt in real time. And I said to myself, all right, how do I answer this apartheid claim without using words like apartheid, without using the word oppression and without using the word not? And so here's what I did. Mr. Barguzzi was born in Qatar. He was raised in Egypt and he got his degree at the University of Tel Aviv, where he studied together with Christians and Jews and Arabs, all experiencing equal rights and equal opportunity in a country where Arabs serve as Supreme Court justices, as lawyers and doctors and actors and everything that, that human beings do, including members of government. And when asked about this at UCLA in 2016, Mr. Barghouti said that they were collaborators. All right, so you see what I did there? First of all, I discredited him a little bit. He's saying this is apartheid. Well, anyone who knows what apartheid is knows that it's not a place where you get to study in university with everybody else. And then instead of talking about what Israel isn't, I spoke about what Israel is, a place where you have people of all these different ethnicities and religions doing all of these different things. And that really is the truth. Now, if, if we had more time, keep in mind, this is a debate where I get maybe 30 seconds to express my answer. At a deeper level, we could get into the truth that Israel does experience uh, racial tensions and, and problems with racism uh, just as much as any other modern Western liberal democracy. Here, I keep using that phrase over and over, modern Western liberal democracy. Because my, my goal here is not to say that Israel is perfect, but that Israel is comparable to the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, the European Union. Israel is not comparable to places uh, like dictatorships or terror states where people really don't have rights. And so uh, my it, it, at a greater level of depth, sure, there's there are racism in, in Israel, but Israel handles it as well as any country, and I'd say better than most, maybe not the best in the world, but certainly among the best. And uh, certainly there is legal equality for everyone. And to the extent that there's racism, Israel is certainly no worse than the United States and in many ways does a lot better under very difficult circumstances. And that is the standard that we should compare Israel to, is one that's realistic in the real world. And that's a way of being honest and uh, vulnerable and while at the same time engaging people uh, in the areas of, of human rights and, uh, and liberal values. Uh, now, of course, if you're speaking to a conservative audience, you might uh, address other values, you might address values uh, related more to security or more to um, uh, personal freedom or, or other things like that. So you want to take, like, this is what I was saying about meet people where they are. Know the audience you're speaking to. Is it younger? Is it older? Uh, no, is it, is it liberal? Is it conservative? Which values are they on? I honestly believe this. I'll tell you this right now, and I, I believe this from the bottom of my heart. No one has to be pro-Israel. You only have to give Israel a fair chance. And then from there, Israel will stand on its own. I really believe Israel is good enough that given a fair chance and fair presentation in the news, uh, Israel has everything that it needs to be acceptable and even uh, likable and lovable to, to people of all political stripes and of all different values. Uh, I really think Israel is good enough for all that. Not perfect, but good enough. Uh, and that is the philosophy on which I base the work that I do. So because the movement is beginning to have an economic impact even, with major pension funds pulling their investments from Israeli banks or international companies involved in Israel's human rights violations, this is precisely the traction that Israel dreads. If it really were, you wouldn't be able to use your computer or your cell phone, you wouldn't be able to access much of the clean drinking water on Earth or many of the medications that you use. These are the kinds of exports that Israel creates. A great example is SodaStream. BDS pressured them to move their factory, which costed hundreds of Palestinians their jobs. How? All right. So this is um, this is a uh, an important point. It's you know it's very clever and fun to be able to criticize BDS and saying, oh, you really want to boycott Israel? Stop using your cell phone. Stop using uh, you know clean drinking water. Stop using all these things. And you know there's value in that in that it gives it's an, an opportunity to share that Israel does a lot of uh, valuable things in the world, but in front of the wrong audience, it could it could create a problem. And the problem it creates is this, that you never want to get into the, uh, the role of saying um, that because Israel invents a lot of things, it's okay for Israel to be an oppressor to other people. That, is, of course, is not what you're trying to say. And so you notice I brought that up 
when Barghouti gave me an opportunity to bring that up and to brag a little bit about the positive things Israel does, I did that. But it wasn't my main point. It wasn't the point I led with. I just worked it in in the middle there. Uh, and if it was a much shorter debate and, and there was only an opportunity to bring up one or two topics, that is not the topic I would leave with, because even though I'm proud of all the good work Israel does, um, that is not an excuse for Israel to be an oppressor, which is why my main point is that Israel is not an oppressor, not because Israel invents neat things, but because Israel simply is not. Um, and uh, now this is a very interesting question, so put some good thought into this one. Uh, can one be critical of Israel and Israel's policies without being labeled anti-Semitic? How can one be critical of Israel and Israel's policies without being labeled anti-Semitic? You know, this is one that comes up a lot and it comes up in our own personal lives these days. Uh, and so you'll see something that I did here, which is really interesting. The first thing I did is I stopped and I smiled and I made a little joke and I laughed at the joke. And then I spoke in a way that was lighthearted, and then I gradually got into speaking in a way that's serious. It's going back to that principle of be smart and likable. Know the facts, have the knowledge, know the jargon, but speak in a way that connects with people so that you also seem like a real human being and, and demonstrate empathy. And then finally meet people where they are with their values, uh, which means knowing the audience uh, to which you're speaking. Well, if you're critical of Israel and Israel's policies, you have something in common with just about every person in Israel. We have a joke that we have 9 million prime ministers because everybody thinks they're right. Uh, but I'll tell you what, in the world, there are 57 Muslim states. There are over 100 Christian states. There are six Buddhist states. There's only one Jewish country. It's one of the smaller countries in the world with a size less than New Jersey and a population less than New York City. And it is the only one that is singled out by BDS, not for criticism, but for total destruction. Now, I'm not saying that singling out the world's only Jewish state for total destruction is anti-Semitic, but I can't imagine what else it would be. All right, so you can see that is, um, that is uh, our, uh, my, my little debate there with, um, uh, with Omar Barghouti. And, and you can see what I did at the end, which was I said, uh, um, I, I pointed out the, the double standard that people are applying, that uh, you know there's only one Jewish state in the world and it has as much right to exist as the 57 Muslim states and the over 100 Christian states and the six Buddhist states. Again, tapping into those, those values. Um, there's uh, uh, there's, um, there's uh, something else I'd like to show you right now. Uh, let's see if I can share the screen again. I just wanna share this because this is uh, our website. The topic that I was speaking to you about before is killing Iran's nuclear scientists a war crime. So the press conference I gave started with an article that I wrote on our website. And you can see in the article, I have tweets quoted in here, and I also have um, links to all of the source material. And when I get down here to analyzing the law, I have links to uh, the, the, specific, um, the specific areas of law and the specific uh, uh, sections in the Geneva Convention so uh, anytime somebody wants to uh, examine our work closely and have all the tools that you need to be able to really speak well, we try to make that available to you. Uh, and uh, this, this is where my paper is, but this is uh, the homepage here, which is uh, honestreporting.com. And you can see all of our latest critiques here. And this one in particular is one in which we actually defended a journalist, uh, a really excellent correspondent from the Washington Post who was not always uh, positive about Israel, but I think was always fair, which is really the standard we look for, is to always at least be fair, uh, was left the Washington Post and ended up being hired uh, to work in the office of uh, Elad Erdan, who's uh, going to be Israel's uh, ambassador to the UN. And uh, she, um, she took that job and a website called Electronic Intifada criticized her, but they didn't do it in a way that was fair. They did it in a way that was really based on uh, conspiracy theory. Um, and, uh, and we took, uh, we criticized their, their critique and, uh, defended that journalist because, uh, our goal here is not to be harsh on journalists. It's to promote fairness and accuracy in media. And sometimes that means criticizing journalists, but also once in a while, it does mean defending them when that's appropriate. Uh, so that is, uh, an overview of honest reporting. Like I said, we're separate from honest reporting Canada. They're a nice organization too. Um, and uh, we're a nonprofit supported entirely by uh, private charitable donations. And the power we have really is grassroots. When we write a critique 
about a news story, we will uh, put a call to action to all of our followers and thousands of emails will go to the editor of the newspaper. And, uh, and, and that makes a real difference when, when newspaper editors or journalists see that people notice and that people care, especially if you're approaching them with a really knowledgeable, fact-based, deep understanding of where they got something wrong. Um, so with that, uh, uh, Barbara, if you uh, would like to begin uh, reintroducing the questions, I would be more than happy to uh, talk to people. Thank you, Daniel. I just would like to add that at CJA, we also encourage people and we get thousands of people to write into government on issues that affect the Jewish community. And, and the same as, as what you were just describing, it is a very effective way to use grassroots um, support for, for our causes. So um, I, I appreciate and understand what you mean. Uh, I have a question. In an opinion piece in the Times of Israel, by Dove Lipman on President Obama's new book, Promised Land. Dove criticized the author for chapter 25 as being revisionist history on Israel. Um, are you aware of that book? And if you are, we'd appreciate your comments. Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, you know, it's um, it's a very thoughtful critique and uh, and I do believe that Dove's, uh, Dove's criticisms are correct. As honest reporting, we're very careful to not take political positions. Uh, we uh, don't want to be perceived as being for or against any American president or any uh, British prime minister, and also not for or against any Israeli prime minister, because um, we've been uh, defending Israel for 20 years. And in that time, we've had prime ministers right, left, and center on the political spectrum, and we've had uh, American presidents, both Republican and Democrat, and uh, we've always uh, valued the friendship with America and always uh, worked, um, worked to defend Israel no matter what. Uh, but I would say this, if you're uh, speaking in your private life to someone who uh, is critical of President Obama, there certainly is room for criticism and there, there is room to, uh, to criticize some of the inaccuracies uh, in his book. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're speaking to someone who supports President Obama and that person says, well, I'm against Israel because... I'm, uh, I'm a Democrat and Obama's a Democrat and Obama's against Israel, my response to that would be, well, actually, that's not true. Uh, President Obama, among other things, when he was uh, really upset that, at the high number of civilian casualties that American forces were causing in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, he sent the Joint Chiefs of Staff to Israel as part of what's called the Lessons Learned Program to learn from Israel how to reduce civilian casualties. So when it was on an issue that uh, President Obama really cared about and really wanted to make a difference, he turned to the best experts at reducing civilian casualties and at being careful. Uh, and so that's just one example of the ways in which you can know your audience and speak in a way that supports Israel while reaching people where they are. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions about the settlements. Um, how do you respond to questions about the settlements and colonialism in the media, and are you avoiding the issue, or do you do you avoid the issue because it's too contentious, or do you how do you deal with it? Well, we don't take a position on the issue because uh, within Israel, it's a topic of of uh, legitimate debate, and it's also a topic of debate outside of Israel. And it's not it's our place to defend Israel, uh, but when Israelis have a debate about a topic, it's not our uh, place to take a side on that topic. And so we don't take a side for settlements or against settlements. Uh, but we do uh, insist that this be uh, presented in the news in a way that's fair. So, for example, when a news article indicates that maybe a certain Jew deserved to die because he was just a settler, we take issue with that. And we say, look, you can be against settlements if you want, but you cannot minimize the death of this person who was a human being living in his home. Uh, it, similarly, when uh, someone makes the claim that settlements are uh, against international law, uh, I go back to that legal analysis and I won't do it uh, uh, with settlements because it'll take just as long as it took to do it with uh, uh, killing for, uh, the, the Iranian nuclear scientist, but um, Fad Rizadeh. But I will say that there is a uh, legitimate debate among legal so scholars as to whether it violates international law or not. And uh, any journalist should point out that there is a legitimate debate on this topic and, uh, and, and even maybe go into depth about how that debate is based in law and not simply parrot the conclusion that they violate international law when that is far from uh, settled. 
Thank you. How, how would you characterize Honest Reporting's relationship with the media, especially in the U.S.? Are you respected or are you a thorn in their sides or a bit of both? Well, you know, media is a funny word because it represents uh, hundreds of companies employing thousands of people and uh, different people are different. Uh, but what we found is that our Media Central program is very respected among the local correspondents here in Israel from all the major publications, New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, they all come to our press conferences. Uh, and when we reach out with criticisms toward journalists, many times we're able to just pick up the phone or send an email and, and talk to them and, and uh, work it out because we know them and respect them and they respect us. Uh, other times, uh, it, uh, a journalist might not be responsive and then we have to apply pressures such as a grassroots email writing campaign. And there are certainly some journalists who dislike us uh, but I'd say they are a minority and they tend to be journalists who are more on the opinionated side uh, and are uh, a journalist who's very professional is going to at least everyone has opinions, but a good journalist is one who tries to keep those opinions out of their writing. Journalists who see themselves as activists are also the ones who will sometimes tend to see us as an enemy, but journalists who care about professionalism usually understand and respect uh, what we're doing and see us as an asset for them to be the best professionals they can be. Great, thank you. How do you deal with Facebook and Twitter? It's something that uh, so many of us don't understand, but but do understand the reach of uh, both of these platforms. Yeah, you know, the funny thing about social media is that on the one hand, it made our job better because we can speak directly to people uh, and, and speak to a wide range of, of listeners. Uh, on the other hand, it made our job harder because now everyone can speak directly to people. And even though journalists aren't perfect, now you don't even need to be a journalist in order to have a widespread audience. Uh, but when uh, we, we work very hard to try and um, bring a little bit of sanity to the conversation. Uh, just recently, we teamed up with a number of other organizations and with the Israeli Knesset and uh, got Facebook to implement a new policy uh, saying that a Holocaust denial violates their terms and conditions and Holocaust denying posts will be taken down. So we played a role in that. Uh, just a couple months ago, we worked to uh, get a video by Louis Farrakhan from the 4th of July, uh, which was a horribly anti-Semitic conspiracy theory ranting kind of video. And we got the uh, YouTube to take that down by doing exactly this grassroots letter writing campaign and and, uh, and YouTube uh, does pay attention when they're getting a, a flood of, of emails on a or complaints on a particular topic. So we work whenever we have the opportunity, we work to sort of rein it in. Uh, but of course, um, there's still, a, 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 it's kind of the wild west out there. And there's a, we, we always have to triage a little bit and say, if somebody has a small number of followers, maybe we don't address that. When someone's very influential, maybe we do. Thank you. Um, you know, we could go on for, hours with you because this is fascinating and the work that you do is so crucial. So I, this is the last question um, and it's a big one. It's uh, what should we look for from President Biden when it comes to Israel? What should you look for? You know, it's a very good question because I'll tell you what, a democracy doesn't end on election day. It's, it's when it only begins and you should always be writing to your Congress people and to your president and making your voice heard and letting them know where you stand uh, because politicians do respond to that, especially if they would like to get reelected, which most politicians do. Uh, you should look for treatment that is fair. You should look for a president who respects the needs and the values of, of Israel, uh, who acts in America's best interests, but also understands that as an American ally, what's a strong and safe Israel is in America's best interests. Um, when there was the debate over the Iran nuclear deal, for example, 78% uh, of Israelis were against it. Now, as an American, you could be for it or you could be against it, but you would want to ask your president to take the feeling of the Israeli people uh, very seriously, especially since we have to live uh, in, in Iran's backyard. Uh, you want to see a president who holds Israel to fair standards and not double standards that if there's uh, a standard of behavior that one applies only to Israel and not to other countries, if there's something you criticize Israel for that you don't criticize other countries for, that is not only unfair, but it actually fits the international definition of anti-Semitism. So look for fair treatment, look for fair standards, not double standards, look for attentiveness 
to what the Israeli people and the Israeli representatives are saying. And, uh, and most of all, uh, look for that deep understanding that Israel is an American ally and a strong, safe Israel is important for a strong, safe America. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Cecil Brower, uh, and I'm a member of the Adath Israel Congregation. We hope everyone uh, found the program rewarding, and thank you for giving your time on such a beautiful December Sunday. With news being delivered 24-7, as well as news media ideology being subjected on us and then supplemented, by social media resulting in the ease of spreading lies, untruths, and hidden agendas. Honest reporting is, a, is vital not only to the world at large, to monitor journalists and media, but to the Jewish community as well. History is easily manipulated, and so our community needs to pay attention. A special thanks to Barbara Banks, our moderator, for her poise and grace on today's topic. Your understanding of the issues involved and your community involvement and leadership with, with CJA is very evident today. To Daniel, thank you for not only your interesting and insightful discussion today. Just reading your website is so informative and relevant and clear that you live honest reporting every minute of every day. Your passion is an inspiration, and you have provided us with tools to engage in conversation with everyone who unfairly criticizes Israel. Thanks to the Adult Education Committee and its chair, Joe Traeger, as well as Phil David, our executive director, and Anna Gindon of Adith Israel for putting on this, afternoon, this afternoon's program. A recording of the presentation will be posted to the Adith website within a couple of days. We look forward to seeing you at future Adath programs, especially the ones featuring Harold Mednick Gershwin, a musical interlude, and Tal Becker, legal counsel for Israel, Emiratis, Bahrain Peace Treaty. Thank you all for attending and have a very good afternoon.